Okay, it's gonna be my list of the top 25 uh, TNA pay-per-views. Um, so this weekend, we're TNA Impact, they're celebrating their 21st anniversary with Slammiversary coming up July 15th on Saturday night. So it's cool, man. Uh, them running Slammiversary in July, it, it gave me some extra time to put this list together. Uh, just want to make clear, this is going to be a list uh, of just the TNA pay-per-views that were three hours. Uh, so I'm not going to count the NWA TNA pay-per-views from 2002 to 2004. And I'm not going to count the uh, pay-per-views that were rebranded as Impact Wrestling. So this is just strictly TNA three-hour pay-per-views. Just want to make that clear. So some honorable mentions before we get down to it. I'm going to go with uh, Genesis 2005. That's what Christian Cage uh, made his TNA debut. Uh, Turning Point 2006, that featured the Angle Joe rematch. Uh, in my opinion, still the best Kurt Angle Samoa Joe match. Uh, no Surrender 2007. That featured Kurt Angle defending the uh, his championship belts three times in one night. The highlight would be the uh, X Division title loss to Jay Lethal. Turning point 2008. This is the start of the main event mafia. Uh, Kurt Angle and Abyss uh, steal the show. Uh, Sting actually wrestled AJ Styles in what's kind of like a forgotten uh, Sting and AJ match. Uh, Final Resolution 2009. Great double main event right there. Uh, Kurt Angle versus Nigel McGuinness. You also had AJ Styles and Christopher Daniels in a great double main event there. And then we had Destination X 2011, where Austin Aries earns a TNA contract, and the rest is history. Uh, once again, you got another AJ Styles and Christopher Daniels main event. That main event kind of dragged. I, I hate to say it, but the Destination X main event between AJ and Daniels, uh, that, that might have been their weakest match. But those would be some honorable mentions. But let's get right down to it. Here we go. We're finally here. We got the top 25 TNA pay-per-views. At number 25, I'm going to go with Genesis 2006, the biggest buy rate in TNA history. They do 60,000 buys. You got Kurt Angle and Samoa Joe um, in the main event. They delivered. I think that match is still great. Uh, the rest of the card is severely underwhelming, though. It, it looks like an amazing show on paper. This is the TNA show that should have done what All Out 2021 did for AEW. But, you know, just just a lot of weird booking going on with the undercard. Undercard looks really, really good on paper. It just fell short. But Angle and Joe, I still think it really did deliver, even though it was a little bit short. At number 24, we're going with Slammiversary 2006. Uh, so Jeff Jarrett wins the NWA championship uh, back. He gets a lot of trash thrown at him. He got a lot of heat on that show. AJ Styles, Christopher Daniels, they won the tag titles. Uh, Samoa Joe gets a, you know, a non-X division win under his belt against Scott Steiner. It's just a really, really fun show. That Slammiversary 2006 just did a review of if you want to hear more uh, in-depth uh, thoughts. At number 23, we're going to go with Lockdown 2005. Uh, the first lockdown, the first pay-per-view, where every single match is inside of a steel cage. You know, you had some ups and downs here. Obviously, the darkest moment on the show would be Chris Candido, uh, you know, breaking his ankle. And that would lead, lead to his uh, death, unfortunately. There's a dark side of the ring with Chris Candido where they, they talk in depth about that. Uh, but the highs are pretty damn high, man. You know, Christopher Daniels and Elix Skipper, you know, delivered for the X Division. AJ knocks it out of the park against Abyss in the main event, which still might be the best match to ever take place at lockdown. So we're going to go with lockdown 2005 at number 23. At number 22, we're going to go with Bound for Glory uh, 2009. Yeah, when I showed when I first saw the show on DVD, man, I, I thought it was really damn good. The the ultimate X opener uh, probably stole the show. W one of the more dangerous stunt fests in TNA history, and I, I got to say, AJ Styles and Sting, this had tremendous build, and um, you know everything about it was sweet up until the finish. So I got to go with Bound for Glory 2009 at number 22. Number 21, we're going to move along to Sacrifice 2006. So Christian Cage. And Abyss, they have a full metal mayhem um, in the main event here. Uh, I, I thought it did deliver. It was violent. It was brutal. Uh, th they had a difficult time following the rest of this card. The highlights are on the undercard here. AJ Styles and Christopher Daniels have their best match against America's Most Wanted. Really creative finish with Gail Kim 
throwing down a knife stick from the rafters for AMW to retain the titles there. And then at the same time, you got a, you know, Samoa Joe moving out of the X division and uh, that tag match over delivered. Joe looked awesome in that tag match against Scott Steiner as he teamed up with Sting. So that sacrifice 2006. Um, the World X Cup stuff could have been a little bit better. You did get Jushin Thunder Liger taking on Petey Williams. But overall, a lot of the World X, X Cup stuff kind of felt flat. But other than that, you, t you had some really, really good stuff on Sacrifice 2006. And number 20, going to go with Victory Road 2004, the very first three-hour pay-per-view. I got to say, these early 2004, um, you know, 05 TNA pay-per-views, they felt huge. They felt good. Uh, great environments. They felt like they were special shows. I, I thought the the Battle Royal to start this show uh, was phenomenal. And then it, it ended up being a one-on-one -on -one match once it got down to two guys. So that definitely delivered. Uh, AJ puts over Petey Williams. Petey, Petey actually beats AJ with the Canadian Destroyer, arguably the best Canadian Destroyer ever by Petey Williams, delivered to AJ Styles. That match doesn't get talked about a lot because it's kind of on the short side. And then Jeff Hardy actually loses to Jeff Jarrett in the main event in a ladder match, which is pretty much forgotten. Like, not a lot of people talk about that. But you get to see Jeff Jarrett uniting with Kevin Nash and Scott Hall in the main event of the very first three-hour uh, Victory Road pay-per-view right there. Okay, at number 19, I got Sacrifice 2005. Another great show. I mean, I think this show could have been a little bit better. It looks sexier on paper than it actually was, but you got Christopher Daniels and Austin Aries for the X Division title. That was, uh, you know, almost like an open challenge. And this is where Daniels, I think he lost a lot of credibility with the diehard Ring of Honor fans. He called himself Mr. TNA, and he called Aries Mr. Ring of Honor. It's almost like TNA put themselves above Ring of Honor with the way they booked this match. But still, man, I think Aries and Daniels, that was a hell of an attractive match. I believe Aries actually was voted in uh, to get the title shot there. At the same time, you got Samoa Joe and AJ Styles for the, uh, I believe it was the X Division Cup match, the finals. You got one of the best AJ Joe matches. The match was stiff. It was brutal. It was awesome stuff. So that stole the show. And then the tag match was really good as well. You got an ECW driven, you know, main event here with Jarrett teaming up with Rhino to take on Raven and Sabu. So very ECW oriented, really planted the seeds for Rhino to take the belt uh, from Jeff Jarrett with Rhino actually getting the pinfall. Uh, to end the main event. So yeah, Sacrifice 2005, it's a good show. It, it actually looks a lot sexier on paper, though, because I just don't think Aries and Daniels got enough time. But we're going to move on to number 18. We got Bound for Glory 2012. There's a lot of mixed feelings on this show. Um, the highs are pretty damn high. You got Bobby Roode and James Storm. Uh, you finally got the blow-off match here. This was a street fight, no disqualification match, and it over-delivered. This was CTE City. You had King Mo as a special enforcer, but goddamn, man, they beat the crap out of each other with those trash cans. You had thumbtack bumps. You just had a great, intense brawl. And, um, you know, in 2012, I, I got to say the production values, uh, they, all, they definitely felt like they were at an all-time high. Uh, at this point, you know, the, the triple threat tag was pretty cool. You had a combination of the SmackDown Super 6 talent like Chavo and Kurt Angle mixing it up with a lot of TNA homegrown talent. I thought the match could have been better, but Chavo Guerrero and Hernandez actually win the tag titles in the uh, three way tag match, which is pretty damn good. Um, the main event drove me crazy, though. You had Austin Aries and Jeff Hardy. They, they built up this Bound for Glory series. You had so much talent. I, I don't know. I was I was underwhelmed with Jeff Hardy getting the title shot. I just thought there were so many other guys that you could have created a classic with. I thought Austin Aries and AJ Styles would have been a beautiful main event uh, for this pay-per-view. But hey, Jeff Hardy goes over. The fans hated it. The fans were not into Jeff Hardy here. I did not think Jeff looked good. I thought Aries really carried the bulk of the match. And uh, yeah, I was not happy with this decision. You know, this is this is the this is the pay per view where I stopped watching TNA, and I just think it hurt the company. You know, someone like me, I spent you know thousands of dollars on TNA pay per views and TNA DVDs, and obviously watching Impact, you know, every single week. 
And I go from not spending any money on TNA to never watching the product on television. That adds up. If, if there's, you know, a lot of those people out there, that adds up. And ultimately, I just think it led to Spike TV not renewing the television deal. And the proof is in the pudding, too. You look at those Jeff Hardy main events, Jeff Hardy versus Sting. There's, there's times where he just did not show up ready to wrestle, and the rest is history. So this is an example of the right guy not going over. You have a hot fresh talent in Austin Aries who just won the belt, who's on the verge of something special, and you take it away from him by just going backwards. And uh, I just thought it was a bad decision. And uh, I know a lot of people like this pay-per-view a lot more than I do, but um, I just think th this is an example of where the booking uh, definitely hurt, um, you know, the impact of the company, uh, in my opinion. So that's Bound for Glory 2012. Number 17, going to go with Final Resolution 2005. The problem with this pay-per-view was I thought, thought the undercard was horrible here. You had uh, you had Dustin Rhodes actually taking, I believe it was Eric Watts. Yeah, there was just a lot of stuff on the undercard here that I just didn't find very attractive. I, I think they were still trying to find their groove in terms of sound quality, in terms of production values. But the triple main event is damn awesome. You got the best Ultimate X match ever here. This is a highlight reel here. AJ Styles you know, took some amazing bumps and. Not it's not just the the bump from the top of the cables. It's you know s some of the um, inverted DDTs, some of those springboard inverted DDTs from AJ were beautiful. So Saban, P and AJ Styles they delivered. You know that's the best Ultimate X match I think I've seen. And then you got AMW and Team Canada in their best match. That's just an old school classic tag match right there. And then Monty Brown though I thought he delivered. He earned himself a title shot against uh, Jarrett in the main event, and Monty and Jarrett delivered. I thought they had good chemistry. I thought they both worked hard, and it was a really engaging main event with a lot of weapons, a lot of guitar shots, and just, uh, yeah, I, I, I thought it was quality stuff. So that's Final Resolution 2005. If there's one pay-per-view on this list that you could argue that should be higher, I would say this is probably it. Number 16, going to go with Sacrifice 2012. So at this time... Um, yeah, it really felt like TNA hired a lot of, you know, guys from the WWE Ruthless Aggression era, whether it be Bruce Pritchard or, uh, I forget his first name, Zahadi, the guy that was in charge of the video packages. So, yeah, I really thought that TNA really kind of found their groove in 2012. I think 2012 was definitely a step up from uh, 2009, 2010, and 2011. Uh, you know, Hogan and Bischoff are still there. You know, Jason Harvey. I think he gave them some good ideas, especially some of the stuff that they did with Dixie and AJ, that affair right there. Uh, but yeah, Sacrifice 2012, it's it's a solid show, man. You got you got an underrated Angle and AJ match. Angle at the time was really, he even admitted on the podcast, he was struggling with his weight, struggling with his addictions to, to alcohol and pills. And it, it definitely resulted in him just putting on a lot of extra bulk. And he had a tough time moving, but him and AJ still delivered. It's probably their most underrated match. A Aries had a great match against Bully Ray, which, you know, showed that he's a fighter. And uh, <laughs> this is where Bully Ray said that he takes craps bigger than Austin Aries. Uh, so that was that was a good match. Um, Rob Van Dam challenging Bobby Roode for in a ladder match for the title. I thought that was really really good. It wasn't great, but it was a cool it was a cool matchup. I just thought he had a lot of good stuff on this show. And then uh, Christopher Daniels and Kazarian win the tag team titles. And they, they booked them as just badass heels uh, at that time. So, yeah, Sacrifice 2012, man. Uh, once again, a very, very good uh, Sacrifice show. Number 15, we're going to go to Bound for Glory 2006. Um the the biggest problem with the show is I I, th I think a lot of people just didn't feel that Sting and Jarrett was was that special of a main event. It was totally overshadowed by what was going on with Kurt Angle and Samoa Joe. So that that I think more than anything hurts Bound for Glory two thousand six. But let's be honest, man, Bound for Glory two thousand six it had some bangers as the kids would call them. Um, you know, Chris Sabin and Senshi 
you know, I thought that stole the show. I, I still think that's that's probably the best early, you know, Bound for Glory match. State of the art athleticism is is the best term uh, for that match right there. You know, LAX and AJ Styles in the in the lockdown match delivered. Um, Christian Cage and Rhino that the eight miles tree fight. I I just, I just thought everything the company just felt hot at the time, and I think more than anything that that's what's really really memorable about Bound for Glory. Uh, 2006. Okay, here we go. We got number 14. We got Victory Road 2008. This featured the uh, World X Cup matches. And um, this was actually from Houston, Texas. I believe True Slayer was actually there uh, for this show. He did a, a live review of it. And yeah, it came off great. You know, definitely one of the highlights of 2008. Uh, so that opener with all the international talent, you had Team Mexico, Team Canada, Team TNA, and Obviously, the most memorable part of the match, you have Masato Yoshino and Naruki Doi from Dragon Gate. So you just had some amazing athleticism from all over the world uh, in the opener right there. Um, trying to think, what else is memorable from the show? I, I just remember the show just being really damn good. Um, the six-man tag with Angle's team versus AJ's team. You had some amazing uh, table bumps there. A very, very exciting six-man tag. Um, the main event actually features Samoa Joe and Booker T, which was kind of a weird match. Ended up being a no finish with Booker T actually hijacking the TNA belt from Joe, but it was still pretty good. It was still pretty physical. You know, you saw Joe actually get involved with, uh, Charmel and Booker T's, uh, you know, family, uh, in the front row. But I just thought, you know, Joe and, and Booker T actually had a pretty damn, damn good old school slugfest right there so yeah definitely check out uh victory road 2008 uh you know de definitely the, i think tna had a really really good summer uh in 2008 number 13 and we're gonna go with lockdown 2006 a little bit of mixed feelings on this show obviously sting was promoted around this show and uh there was a lot of people that thought tna was going downhill uh, at this particular time, I think a lot of it had to do with the pushing of the Dudleys and just a lot of the pushing of some of the, um, you know, ex WWE names. Uh, but at the same time, I just, I just thought you had great variety here. I, I just did an in-depth review of this show, but you know, the, the opener with the, uh, the world X cup stuff was great with, with Shelly and, and lethal and, and Sanjay, uh, you know, that, that was definitely a great opener. Um, you had, Low key returning to the company to take on Daniels, which is underrated. Uh, you know, Samoa Joe and Sabu was short, but it was really, really, really something different. It was, it was really a cool dream match right there. Uh, you know, the lethal lockdown did deliver. You know, AJ, AJ did something monumental on top of the cage. So it's definitely a memorable show. I, I just, I just felt like at this time they were able to showcase that lockdown could give you a little bit of everything and they could keep each and every match fresh even though every single match is inside of the six sides of steel. So that's Lockdown 2006 at 13. At number 12, I'm going to go with uh, Destination X 2012. Um, this show definitely has its flaws. They had an X Division tournament, and the winners actually advanced to an Ultimate X. That kind of came off a little bit flat. Everything about the tournament and even the Ultimate X was pretty forgettable, but you definitely had some attractive matches here. Angle and Joe, I think, had their most underrated match. Joe actually goes over with the uh, with the choke, the submission, but it was very physical. Angle actually just did a podcast uh, talking about that matchup. Um, AJ and Daniels, I thought they delivered. They gave you something different. They had a last man standing match. Daniels was just full fledged heel. I think Daniels did some of his best heel work in 2012. And then the main event, you had Austin Aries using option C. I, I just loved it. I loved the fact that you you could you could hand in the X Division title and, and get a world title shot at Destination X. I, I think it was a great tradition for TNA. Um, it almost kind of reminded me of, uh, you know, Ultimate Warrior, you know, cashing in the Intercontinental title at WrestleMania 6 to get the title shot against Hogan. So it was really cool. I, I mean, Rude, Rude and Aries, like it, it's it didn't really deliver in terms of like, you know, monumental high spots or anything special, but it just had a great crowd. It was a great moment to see Aries win I, more than anything. That video package with with some of Aries promos about how you're not going to out wrestle me. You're not going to outwork me. You're not going to outsmart me. And it just, there's just so much good stuff there. And Rude, Rude really came across like he was old school. He came across like a credible champion. He was champion. One of the longest reigning, maybe the longest reigning 
TNA champion uh, at that point. And, uh, you know, Aries going over was just a hell of an accomplishment, especially where you see where Aries was a couple years later when he had the falling out with Ring of Honor and, you know, he wasn't getting paid and they were asking him to take less money. So it was a great perseverance from Aries. If anything, I thought Aries really kind of reinvented himself with the greatest man that ever lived character. I think this run that Aries had in TNA, I feel like he found, finally found it with the mix of conditioning and he was able to find the way where you could take his character a little bit more seriously in TNA. He kind of developed into more of a character and he was able to blend in the great wrestling machine version and you just had a perfect mix of uh, Austin Aries' abilities um, when he won the belt at Destination X 2012. But, you know, it was kind of short-lived. I wish he had a longer reign, but it just wasn't to be. Uh, number 11, going to go with Against All Odds 2006. So I just reviewed this back in February it's an awesome show, man. A great night for Christian. Christian proves that he could be the man. You know, he was able to upstage Jeff Jarrett and win the NWA world title from Jarrett. And what was a pretty damn good match. Um, I, I thought that match did deliver. You had the rematch of Joe, AJ, and Daniels, which, you know, gets overshadowed. People think they're a turning point match. Uh, you know, a lot of people look at that as the rematch. But no, the, the rematch actually occurred at Against All Odds 2006, where they didn't have the burden of having to carry the main event. So I thought that was great. Rhino and Abyss had, you know, probably the most underrated match on the show. They just had a vintage ECW Falls Count Anywhere match, which featured, you know, some really, really memorable bumps uh, in the crowd. So don't, don't sleep on Against All Odds 2006. Plus, you, you still had some really, really good, you know, underrated X Division stuff with Aries, Shelley, and Strong uh, in the opening match right there. So that's Against All Odds 2006 at number 11. <laughs> At number 10, we have TNA's No Surrender 2005. So this took place in July of 2005. And um, yeah, this to me, like this is the pay-per-view that really started, you know, the hot streak of TNA pay-per-views. Uh, you had an awesome quadruple main event here. Obviously, I think the highlight of the show is Samoa Joe and Chris Saban. This is Joe's. Uh, you know, first amazing match in TNA. You know, Saban was able to get Joe off of his feet. It just really, it it, it was just really eye opening, and, and it I think it made everyone just feel good that you know TNA was actually going to use Joe, uh, really, really, really well here. So um, it's almost it's almost sad for Ring of Honor though. It was almost like, you know, Joe was gonna um you know, become more of a TNA guy than an ROH guy. But at the same time, it was great for Samoa Joe's career. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Him and Saban stole the show. It was awesome stuff. I talked about the match before because of, uh, you know, Samoa Joe's, uh, you know, best of DVD. But uh, definitely check that match out. Also, you had AJ Styles and Sean Waltman. This, this was probably X-Pac's best TNA match. Uh, him and AJ worked really well together. It was an exciting, exciting match right there. I thought the match was really damn good. Um, also, you had Christopher Daniels taking on Petey Williams for the X Division title. This was pretty damn good. I would actually put this above um, a lot of Daniels' X Division title matches. Definitely better than the Aries match. I would even put it above, you know, the Elix Skipper match and even the Shocker match from Hard Justice. So, yeah, Daniels and Petey worked a really good match. This might be Petey Williams' best singles match. You know, the interference from A1 was kind of annoying. But when you look at how this match was structured and the drama and just the execution of it, it just kind of showed you that Daniels really cared about his craft as X Division champion. It felt like he really put more effort into his, uh, you know, TNA matches than his ROH matches. And, you know, this is definitely proof of that. The match delivered, no matter how you want to look at it. Daniels and Petey, great stuff there. And then the main event was pretty damn good. You know, you had Raven, uh, his first NWA def title defense on pay-per-view against Abyss. It was just an... It was a dog collar match, awesome brawl. Yeah, a good dog collar match. Not not one of the better ones, but this was really cool because, you know, you're able to kind of showcase, you know, your homegrown talent at No Surrender with AJ, Joe, and Daniels. And then at the same time, like, you know, you could still bring in some of those ECW diehard fans by having Raven as a champion. I think Abyss is some of that 
perfectly complement some of the ECW homegrown talent. So, yeah, Raven Raven and uh, Abyss definitely did deliver. I think James Mitchell did a beautiful job of, um, you know, hyping up the, the feud with Raven on the mic as well. So that's No Surrender 2005. This might go down as the most underrated, you know, TNA pay-per-view. Um, at number nine, I'm going to go with Turning Point. 2009 hell of a show right here hell of a show hell of a rebound um you know i never looked at it like this but but at the time jared someone like jeff jarrett was a little bit baffled at the turn of direction uh obviously they made a lot of changes they brought in hogan they brought in bischoff but before before you had that january 4th move to monday nights with impact it seemed like they just gave us some a little bit of treats. You know, they brought in Nigel McGuinness as Desmond Wolf, and uh, all of a sudden, we're just going to go back to Joe, AJ, and Daniels in the main event. Um, but hey, I'll give them credit. I thought they did some really, really good storyline stuff here with Joe being the instigator, you know, trying to spark some jealousy between AJ and Daniels. I thought this was some good storyline stuff. It wasn't, it wasn't, it didn't come off like, oh, let's just throw them in the main event without any story at all. It did not come off like that. And I got to say, Joe, AJ, and Daniels, not quite as good as, um, you know, the heyday from 2005, but pretty damn good, though. People still loved it. It still ended up being, you know, a top 10 match of the year for 2009. And uh, but, you know, what really stole the show here, I think, looking back on it is Angle and Nigel. Um, it was really, really cool, the story here, because Nigel um, presented himself as someone that that knew Kurt Angle better than he knew him because he was watching Angle his whole career. But Angle never watched Ring of Honor. Um, you know, Angle really isn't much of a watcher, even though he loves wrestling. So he had no idea who Nigel was, but they had instant chemistry. You saw the British style blend in perfectly with you know angles amateur style and they just made for some great submission oriented matches and yeah i mean the chemistry was just unbelievable uh and it was very 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 well received by the fans there was a lot of respect for a very unorthodox style of wrestling uh so angle actually goes over with a uh, triangle choke which nigel tried to say was an illegal hold but it was it was a great matchup that turning point match between angle and nigel uh, was a treat. It, it was cool. You know, I mean, this, this TNA run for Nigel was short lived, but, you know, obviously I would have loved for him to go to the WWE and, uh, you know, you wish he would have passed the physical, but the silver lining was at least you got some of this, uh, you know, the, this feud with Angle was, uh, you know, totally memorable. I, I really, really loved it. Um, but, you know, I just, you, you always wish that Nigel could have had a better career, you know, no doubt about it. At number eight, I'm going to go with Bound for Glory 2008. Um, definitely the most stacked Bound for Glory on paper. I, I think everything here was good. Everything here was really, really good. There, there wasn't that one match that really blew me away, but you just had great consistency here. You had Angle and Jarrett, which had a lot of heat to it with the real life situation and you know at the time angle was you know stated that he might go back to wwe and you know jared took offense to that so i thought i thought angle and jared had had you know great old school emotion to it you know uh, aj styles christian and booker t they gave you a nice little triple threat match where they had great chemistry um the monsters ball tag over delivered you, you saw some dangerous scary moments there with abyss being burned so that delivered you know the undercard kind of sucked here but you know once you got to the the meat of the card it was just, just just one quality match after another um and then obviously you had sting uh taking on samoa joe uh in the main event which was samoa joe kind of returning the form you know joe kind of had a very you know soft title reign where you know he really wasn't able to be himself but he was able to bust out some amazing things here, including the um, the drop kick off the rafters to Sting, which was pretty damn cool. But, you know, Sting goes over, he wins the title, kind of sets the tone for the main event mafia. So you just had an incredible show here with uh, Bound for Glory 2008. Awesome, awesome Bound for Glory, in my opinion, in Chicago. Number seven, I'm going to go with Slammiversary 2012. This was... This was when I just noticed, wow, you know, TNA is really rebounding well. You know, you kicked off the show with Austin Aries defending the X Division title against Samoa Joe, which was amazing stuff. You know, Aries and Joe have amazing chemistry. And, um, yeah, it, it was pretty damn cool. 
You know, the, the, this this really set the tone, I think, for that whole summer for Austin Aries' emergence. So, yeah, I think Aries and Joe was phenomenal. Um, Angle, Angle and AJ had an awesome tag match against Kaz and Daniels, which had a great storyline. The Dixie, the Dixie AJ storyline, where Dixie's actually cheating with AJ, and uh, the husband finds out about it, and when the, the the scene where Dixie actually goes into the production truck, and she's like, "Who aired this? Who aired this?" And she's like, "Shut it!" And she's yelling at Taz. She's like, "Who?" It's like, "Who's the one that? Who's the one that's airing it? Shut it off!" I, Dixie was great here. This is a great storyline. Um, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm hearing now that it was actually Eric Bischoff and Jason Harvey that that were behind it, and uh, Frankie Kazarian and Daniels did did a great job playing pricks here, and the match delivered too. Angle actually said it's his favorite tag match of all time. I would totally disagree with that. I think Kurt is forgetting the No Mercy 2002 tag. Um, but hey, man, uh, it was an awesome match. Angle Angle was great here. It was you know just very well put together. AJ was uh, tremendous. You just saw some amazing action here. Um, just you know, in 15 minutes, they stole the show and. They gave you, you know, arguably the arguably the best tag match in TNA history in terms of just straight up two on two. Um, it was it was an amazing match right there. I, I definitely think Meltzer underrated it. He gave it four and a quarter. I, I would say this is at least four and a half. It's funny, like when they when when they when they read back the rating on the podcast. Uh, the guy said, you know, Meltzer gave it four and a quarter, and Angle goes like, oh, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> but hey man it was it was a great time and the, the main event was pretty good it was robert rude and sting it was a great night for sting as they announced that he was going to be inducted into the hall of fame i mean the finish was what it was you know rude kind of wins in you know unclimatic you know anticlimactic fashion with the beer bottle and it's just a crappy finish but at least sting gets the last laugh as he gives him the scorpion death drop off the top of the balcony so everybody went home happy and uh, yeah, Slammiversary 2012, you, you, it just it felt like a complete show. It, it felt like one of the one of the best, you know, TNA pay per views from top to bottom, just in terms of quality and uh, storytelling. And not to mention, you had a really really fun uh, Bully Ray and, and Joseph Parks match, which was pretty damn cool with Abyss, you know, making a surprise return. So I, I think Slammiversary 2012 that it, it's got to be the greatest comeback TNA pay per view that I think there's ever been okay at number six i got bound for glory 2005 so the very first bound for glory i, I just thought they did a good job of making it feel like their biggest pay-per-view of the year and and let's keep in mind they're still in the impact zone here and you know they they did a beautiful job of making it feel special um i just thought you had great variety throughout this whole thing i mean yeah i mean there, there's certain stuff on this show where you could really do without you know i i think from a talent standpoint there's a lot of talent that you really didn't care to see on the undercard, but the highs were pretty damn high. I just, I love the fact that you had Joe wrestle Liger. I thought it gave it a alternative international feel. Um, you know, the X division, you know, pre-show stuff was pretty damn good. You had Aries strong and Shelly, the generation X guys really tear it up. And, um, I, I thought that was really, really cool that they were able to shine on this show. Uh, AJ and Daniels, I, I really feel like their best work was in 2005. I, I think these two Ironman matches, uh, the Against All Odds one and this Bound for Glory one, I think this is their best work together. I think it blows away, you know, anything that they did, you know, later on. Um, and then obviously the Monsters Ball was, was, was pretty damn good. You know, Jeff Hardy had some monumental bumps. Uh, you know, Rhino... Sab Sabu was crazy. Uh, Abyss was great. I mean, it was that, that Monsters Ball has never been topped. That's the best Monsters Ball match. I, you know, the the the, the Ultimate X is is one thing that you wish could have been better. I mean, everything was aligned properly in terms of talent and ex in who you exactly want in that match. You just wish that little X didn't keep falling from the cables because you know that could have been a really really sweet Ultimate X match. But I don't know. You know, a lot of people have mixed feelings on that little battle royal to get the title shot at jeff jarrett I, I know daniels thought he should have been in it and you know the match just kind of felt like it was just rushed and thrown together but uh great night for rhino though i i, I think i think rhino uh definitely gave the company some juice it, it was great redemption from him after you know the nightmare that he went through at wrestlemania 21 weekend with him getting fired and 
you know, everything that went on there. So I thought I thought Rhino and Jared, even though it really didn't, you know, get a lot of time, I, I thought it, it felt like a huge deal. It felt like a good moment. So overall, Bound for Glory 2005, I think it's a great show. It, it, it definitely... It definitely is a lot more satisfying than I think even, you know, some of the other TNA pay-per-views um, that might have been better in terms of like star star rating wise, if that makes any sense. Uh, number five, I'm going to go with TNA's uh, Sacrifice 2007. So yeah, uh, first pay per view I ordered in 2007. The the timing was perfect. It was it was right after school. Um, after the school year ended and God, I, I just thought it was an amazing show from top to bottom. I, I, I thought you had great talent here. Obviously, you know, James Storm and Chris Harris, the America's most wanted guys had broke up at this time and you had the Texas death match. And uh, that, that definitely stole the show. It's arguably the best TNA match of 2007. Um, you know, I, you you just had tremendous quality here. I, I I did a full review of it that almost went 40 minutes. I just love the show. I think the X Division opener with, with Jay Lethal, Saban, and Sanjay was sweet. Um, AJ and Joe had, you know, kind of a disappointing match, but you still got AJ and Joe. I mean, it's just, it is what it is there. You had, you had Loki on the show, Jerry Lynn. I mean, the amount of talent on this show is unfucking deniable and not to mention you have Jeff Jarrett, you know, making his return after his wife had passed away uh, against uh, Robert Roode. Uh, I thought that was really, really cool. And, and then the, the main event is underrated. I think people people bitch about the main event because of how it went off the air with Angle taking the NWA title after a clear defining finish. But I thought Angle, Christian and Sting, they delivered a really, really you know, fun triple threat match for the amount of time that it got. But, uh, but yeah, overall, Sacrifice 2007. Um, I think I think it's one of the more stacked TNA pay per views that we've ever seen. No doubt about it. Okay, at number four, I got Turning Point 2005. So this was the last pay per view of the best year in TNA history, and, and many people thought this was the TNA pay per view of the year. This dominated polls for best TNA pay-per-view of 2005 and um the funny thing is you know Sabu and Abyss I, I think they actually won match of the year from the TNA website the uh, no rope barbed wire match uh so that was really really cool it, it's you know it, it's tough to make that work but it's definitely the more memorable uh, Sabu and Abyss match and I could watch that match and just enjoy it like I don't have to like throw up watching it because some of those barbed wire matches in the past um, that born to be wired one that, that is tough to watch because it's just so brutal you know you don't want to see people get you know choked by that barbed wire uh, but yeah that was really really dope and you know Samoa Joe and AJ rock the house god that match is so good uh you know joe and aj their, their tna matches in 2005 were monumental uh I, th I thought rhino and jeff jarrett was was an incredible main event you know that rhino's an underrated worker you know some of these uh you know jarrett matches were you know they used weapons and they just went over the top a lot of them actually did deliver man like you you, you can't fault jarrett's effort i thought that match did deliver so um yeah, I, you also had Christian. Christian actually making his TNA debut on pay-per-view against Monty Brown. I, I like the chemistry between Christian and Monty on the mic. The highlight would be um, Christian actually asking Monty Brown, what's the capital of, uh, what, what was it? What, what, was it Asia or China? I, I can't even remember, but Monty goes like, well, why don't you tell me, Christian? Enlighten me with your intelligence. And then he goes like, Bangkok. And then he slaps him in the nuts. So I, I thought you know, that was probably the highlight of that feud. I think that actually took place later on. But uh, the bottom line is, man, Turning Point 2005, I, I, I think it's it's definitely one of the best TNA pay-per-views in terms of uh, – you know, quality and just very, very, very little filler. And you, you can see the talent, the talent pool really coming in, coming into its own uh, at that particular time. Uh, and once again, you know, we're going to move along to Turning Point 2004. So, yeah, I, I mean, I think I've stated, you know, Sacrifice as a great legacy for a filler pay-per-view. But the same could be said about Turning Point. Uh, but, yeah, Turning Point 2004, it's, this happened once again in December. This is the last TNA pay-per-view of... Um, you know, only the second TNA pay-per-view of 2004. Obviously, you got to remember this for America's Most Wanted of James Storm and Chris Harris taking on Triple X 
of Elix Skipper and Christopher Daniels. God, th- this this match was awesome. This this took place in the Six Sides of Steel, the lockdown match. Uh, obviously, you're going to remember it for Elix Skipper actually walking on top of the uh, cage and delivering a Hurricane Rana. It, it was breathtaking. You know, one of the best you know stunts in the history of pro wrestling, right there. Um, and it wasn't just that though, you know, they, they did some amazing suplexes here. You just had, you had awesome blood. You had great heel work from Daniels, uh, the AMW guys, you know, they, they delivered some really, really nice finishers with their guillotine leg drop. So the match was awesome, man. Uh, a lot of people think this is the best match in TNA history still. So if you have not seen this match, uh, definitely hunt it down. Really, really good Petey Williams and Chris Saban match. So they were able to prove here that they could still deliver quality X Division stuff without AJ Styles. And then on top of that, you had uh, Macho Man's last match. You know, Macho Man wasn't great here. He wasn't really able to show what he can do. Uh, He was kind of on the way out at this time. But the match was still really, really good, though, thanks to AJ Styles. I thought AJ and Jeff Hardy actually did deliver there as they took on Jeff Jarrett, Kevin Nash, and Scott Hall in a six-man tag. Uh, Macho Man gets the surprise of victory at the end right there. But yeah, Turning Point 2004, um, at this time, it really kind of felt like TNA was going to go, you know, these three-hour TNA pay-per-views, I just felt like they had a really, really great feel to them. And I think Turning Point 2004 uh, was probably the best, like, early you know tna pay-per-view and number two yeah this this was tough number one and number two but at number two i'm gonna have to go bound for glory 2007 you just had a tremendous card here this is the one show from 2007 where i just feel like they finally you know hit a home run uh, i think angle and sting uh was was a great main event you know I, I i think i think angle really did a good job of you know carrying sting you know, to to a to the match that he deserved to have, and it, it came off great. It was a little bit goofy at some parts, but overall, you know, you, you you had you had two stars that had no history together, that were the two biggest stars in the company, and they made it work, and they had good chemistry. You know, uh, Sting at his Hall, Hall of Fame speech even thanked Kurt Angle for the match. He said, "Yeah, Kurt, remember Bound for Glory?" So it's a very positive experience. You know, it almost came across like this was, you know, the highlight of Sting's TNA career. You had the best Samoa Joe and Christian Cage match. You know, obviously you would have loved to seen Joe in the main event here. A lot of people have speculated that it should have been Joe and Angle, you know, built up for the title here. But the bottom line is Joe and Christian still went out there and delivered, you know, uh, one of the best Bound for Glory matches of all time. The, The opener was tremendous between LAX and Triple X in the Ultimate X match. You know, one of the best Ultimate X matches. It just it just set a really exciting tone for the rest of the show. You know, uh, Team 3D and the Steiners was was pretty damn cool as well. It was it was it was a nice uh, you know mixing of you know two great historic tag teams right there. Uh, trying to think what else happened. Uh, AJ Styles and Tomko actually win the tag titles here, I believe. I believe they actually won it from Pac-Man Jones, who actually could not wrestle on this show. So he has still had the whole Pac-Man stuff going on here. But at the same time, it gave TNA some publicity. I'm trying to think, what, what's the underrated match from this thing? Jay Lethal and Christopher Daniels, pretty damn underrated. Uh, a little bit bittersweet, though, is Daniels would actually take time off and become the Curry Man. And then at number one, I'm going to go with the Unbreakable 2005 pay-per-view. Um, you could argue that it's a one-match show, but I got to say, AJ, Joe, and Daniels uh, delivered an unbelievable main event. It, you know, it's it, it's so tough to recreate that magic, but this was a night where it was very magical. It, it got people to take notice of the company. Uh, I, I've always been a big fan of Pro Wrestling Illustrated, and when I saw that this finished runner-up in the match of the year voting i said wow this has got to be fucking good because this pay-per-view did not get a lot of you know promotion so this had to blow this had to blow it out of the water and you know i i blew the 40 bucks from the tna website and when i put it on i was just you know blown away by it you know never seen anything like it you know you got to see an independent wrestling style uh main event 
in the main event of a mainstream pay-per-view. So it was pretty damn cool. I, I you, you can't duplicate, you know, what they did here. All these guys were in their prime. You got to give Daniels a lot of credit for structuring the match because the structure was very similar uh, to the glory, to the um, era of honor begins uh, main event. So yeah, it was great stuff. I, I, I also think AJ winning was the right call because you want to, you kind of wanted to end the pay-per-view on a, a positive note, considering how good it was. Plus it kind of blended in with, uh, you know, TNA, you know, moving the spike TV. So you want to showcase AJ as your X division guy. So it was beautiful stuff, man. And uh, Joe, Joe was uh, phenomenal in the match. Everybody knows how, how much I feel about the match. It's probably one of my th top three favorite matches ever. Um, I got a review of the whole show up right now. So if you haven't seen it, I'll give you more of an in-depth breakdown there. But goddamn, it was it was just so good. And you, you can't recreate that feeling there. You know, they, they came close at Turning Point 2009. They really did. But th there was just something special in the air uh, that night. And the fact that they gave them the main event... Um, they had enough trust in the X Division guys to just give them that platform. Uh, it's definitely really, really memorable. The 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 undercard it, the undercard's pretty damn good. Like I wasn't blown away by anything on the undercard, but you know you got Aries and Strong in in a tryout match. You could definitely see how good they were there, even though it it was nowhere near as good as what they can potentially deliver. Uh, Sabu and Abyss is probably the highlight of the undercard there. I, th I thought Sabu and Abyss was, was really, really, um, you know, something special. I just think that was a good feud for TNA in 2005. Uh, you know, Sabin, Sabin and PD had a good match there, but it wasn't anything where they were capable of. Uh, you know, Rhino and Raven is somewhat disappointing, but that, that main event is so good that it... If there's one TNA pay-per-view that I wish I could go back in time and just invite people to watch and, you know, have a party and just, you know, just really try to appreciate the moment, I got to say, it'd be Unbreakable 2005. It, you know, you could argue that it's a one-match show, but the, the one match, I just think it, um, I, I just think it, it brought TNA to the next level. I, I, it, it took me from being a compilation watcher to a pay-per-view watcher and a loyal follower because i'll be honest with you man that that old 506 year i was you know up and down on tna you know i would watch the show but i wouldn't order the pay-per-views and i wouldn't really follow the company that closely but after i saw this after i saw this pay-per-view this is where the money started coming in i mean i i started spending a lot of money on tna but it wasn't until after i saw unbreakable uh, I mean, the only TNA DVDs I had were, you know, the AJ compilation and the X Division compilation. But this this made me a fan of just the whole company because it was that good. And then I just thought I thought this gave them momentum. I, I really did. So I'm going to go back to Unbreakable 2005 is my number one choice on September 11th, 2005. So there was only one Unbreakable because, you know, the September pay-per-view was not going to fall on September 11th every year. So it was a one shot deal. Uh, I think eventually they went back to another unbreakable uh, title after they rebranded as Impact Wrestling. But, uh, but yeah, so that's it right there. That's my top 25 TNA pay-per-views. Hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I'm out. All right.